Good afternoon. You've joined us on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, bring it, broadcasting from the brand new Think Tech Studios here in Pioneer Plaza. Uh, Likeable Science is all about how science is a fun, enjoyable, accessible part of everyone's life and how we should all revel in it, explore it, and uh, make it work for us. Science should not be something that we consider to be isolated and stuck away in some ivory towers and done only by scientists, but it should be part of everyone's lives. To help me explore this whole idea further today, uh, I have a guest being Skyped in, uh, Al Dr. Alain Ben-Ari. And Dr. Ari Ben-Ari is an anesthesiologist with the Seattle Veterans Administration Puget Sound Healthcare System. He is an assistant professor at the University of Washington Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. And uh, a welcome, Alain. Hello, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thank you for joining me here. I, I appreciate your taking the time out of your busy schedule, because I know you've got uh, about a thousand things going here. Uh, uh, Alain has a, a distinguished uh, career to date and dealt with even bigger things in the future. He uh, went to Rep Horace School of Medicine at Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. He did some further training on anesthesia residency at Harash Hebrew University Medical Center and has done fellowships and served as a faculty member at the Pittsburgh Medical Center. Uh, and now he's there, as I say, at uh, UW and the Seattle uh, VA Hospital. And uh, we're going to be talking about something though, that seems uh, just at first blush very unrelated to anesthesiology and, and pain management. We're going to be talking about data mining. And so maybe you can tell me a little bit here, Alon, just sort of by way of background about how you got interested in this whole area of digging up all kinds of interesting and sort of almost obscure information from big data sets. Now, what does that have to do with anesthesiology? Well, it, it, it actually started uh, some eight years ago after, during my fellowship in Pittsburgh where I worked with a man who had an interesting idea. He wanted to use genetic markers in surgical patients to phenotype pain. When I say phenotype, is basically to classify how come some people have more pain after surgery and others do do better, and it's all the same same procedure. And his, his interesting idea wasn't only academic, he was interested in developing uh, new kinds of drugs. If you look at uh, whatever the, the pharmacy has to offer by ways of medications for pain medicine, it's various derivatives of opioids. It's a drug that has been with us for the past 2,000 years. And non steroidal and anti-inflammatories, and, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. His idea was to use genetic markers to find new sites for pain drugs. Ah, OK. That's his idea. Right. And for that, we needed a lot of data. And he was, and I was very fortunate to work with that man. Um, his name was uh, his name was Richard Max. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, and he was a brilliant man who made sure that I took some courses um, at the University of Pittsburgh. So I had to pick up on statistics and and machine learning and computer science. And those are those are big load of work for me for a while. Yes, indeed. But the, but the question was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it got me going. It's 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 motivating. And after a while, you sort of understand that you can actually learn on your own. And you pick a more and more subject until you accumulate more and more knowledge and technical abilities in in what is now known as data science or data mining or modeling to address a specific question like we had. So that's how I got started. Yes, it, it, it's, it's intriguing that you, because uh, it seems to me you've sort of opened up new doors here. That is, we tend to think of you gather data for very specific purposes and then use the data for those same purposes. But it seems that, in a sense, you've taken that one level further with your, from what you've learned, where you see that the data that was gathered for one set of purposes can be mined for other information that maybe wasn't initially, it wasn't initially intended for. Right. I'm, that is what I'm doing. I'm not entirely original in that. A lot of people are doing this. Um, medicine, aside from taking care of people, is in the business of data. We are. Right. Um, pretty much like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, mm -hmm. Pinterest, and so on. We're, we're generating a lot of data. And 
there's always an interesting question in one's mind, and we're very fortunate, especially today in the, in the, at the VA, that there, there's an infrastructure that was built some 10, 15 years ago that allows access to all these data points, be they administrative data, text of, of clinical notes, most of the data is unstructured. It's what people like me and other providers are putting on, on the computer. And on the other hand, there has been a tremendous uh, opportunity by ways of uh, freely available tools to access these data and manipulate them to a certain end, a clinical question, for instance. Others are doing this for, let's say, Netflix for recommending movies, right. Amazon recommend products, and so on. But, but there's a considerable difference in, in the sense that you are uh, you're, getting, you're dealing with data sets of patient records and uh, doubtless have to get all kinds of clearance and uh, uh, approvals to, to access uh, quite a number of different databases, whereas presumably the folks who are doing Netflix are, are uh, working with a set of people who have voluntarily sort of said, yes, you, you can watch what I'm watching and note, down, note this down and share this freely. Uh, right, you're yeah, absolutely right. So for the, there are a few, a few things to, to that. First of all, you're absolutely right. But firstly, all of us doing research, myself included, care a lot about the subject matter. Mm -hmm. we, we, we just care about it. There's an interesting question you know, that has to do with, with patients' uh, life, outcomes, and so on. So we, we care about it. Second, um, there are a lot of controls and barriers and, 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 and ways to, to make sure that things uh, don't uh, don't get uh, misused or mishandled. Absolutely. Uh, at the VM, for instance, there is a whole work environment where one logs in, that is, after one is clear to log in, and is allowed access to this thing. And the, the technical people in the VA are very helpful. If you need something, no problem. They get it for you. They'll install it for you. We'll have it done. No problem. I, I yet have to see a physician who, uh, who will betray the trust of either the institutional review board or the trust of his patients um, in, in, in trusting their data in third party hands or so. This, that's not happening. Well, that, that's, that's good to know, and uh, it's, it's certainly uh, important that that kind of uh, security be in place because clearly you're dealing with, with potentially sensitive issues. Um, so um, you must have, you probably did, I'd imagine, some preliminary work with, with various other projects before you got into the, these uh, bigger ones that we've talked about here in, in, uh, in earlier conversations. Uh, and you must have had some, uh, discovered the power of, of this approach in general. Um, well, yes. Um, one needs to develop quite a bit. One needs to get very technical. Mm -hmm. That takes time. It's like running a bike. It, you, you need to get good at it. Right. And there were, there were smaller projects. Um, one project was uh, looking at uh, use of uh, uh, in, in surgical patients, that is, use of opioids after surgery. Um, other, other studies looked at the uh, patient's response to cold or heat at, at the surgical site. These were on the order of dozens, dozens of, a, few, a few dozens of patients. Um, I'm trying to work with larger data sets today, if, if possible. Um, the, uh, the, the estimates one gets is, are, are, are better, right. and one gets a more clear answer. Sure. It's, uh, again, I, I'm, I don't know much about statistics, but clearly as you get larger and larger databases with more and more patients, and then you can make stronger and stronger inferences uh, about, about what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, let, let's talk a little bit about that. You, you mentioned this one with the, the patients uh, and the, the opiates in response to knee surgery. So as I understood that, you, you found that patients who, were, who had been taking uh, opiates for some pain conditions, uh, to, to some reasonable extent in the period prior to their knee surgery, fared worse after the surgery than patients who hadn't been doing that. 
This is, uh, this is something that, uh, that is started by my work. One day, the, 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 this was born in a, in a late afternoon conversation where I took care of a few, a few patients, which we typically don't take care of. Uh, they, these patients have no manipulations. It's, a, it's basically a way of releasing adhesions of scar tissue around the new knee after the knee has been replaced uh, a few weeks uh, earlier. And the patient comes in with what is known in the orthopedic surgery uh, world as a frozen knee. I mean, basically the patient has a, does not have the range of motion one would expect. So under anesthesia, this is where I come in, the orthopedic surgeons uh, release the, the adhesions by applying some mechanical force. And what we noticed is that we, we, were, we were taking care of three or four patients that day, and that, that's a lot of patients in one day for, for this thing. It's a pretty rare event. But we noticed that many of them were, were in high dose of narcotics. And the question was, well, clearly that hurts, but whether there are other things which may, may predict uh, uh, the need for a knee manipulation after, after surgery. So we, we went through the, the whole process of accessing uh, records from the Institutional Review Board and the National VA databases, and we were looking at uh, new revisions and new manipulations, and this is currently uh, coming, uh, coming to fruition. Where we're, where it seems like we we're, were able to show that uh, the outcomes after surgery were associated with uh, with the consumption of opioids before surgery. So this is, we're, we're still having our statistician looking at this thing, but that's, that's what, this is, this is the direction of the wind, so yeah. to speak. I, and you think there's a, a, an implication that these two are, are tightly, tightly linked, and that it's not just a, a sort of fluke that the, those same patients who were doing opioids ahead of time had a, a different set of surgeons beforehand who were maybe not as good or something, and the surgeries were less successful. It's hard to say. We were looking at 34,000 patients. I was going to say, you've got this huge set of data on that, right? Yeah. Over, over a six-year period. Um, that's, that's a real number. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's uh, it. Depending on when, when I mean, I, we, we were looking at the numbers and we involved our statisticians. And, I mean, the verdict is still out, but it seems that this is where, the, this, is where this is going to be. Yeah. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's intriguing. It's uh, again uh, something you, you wouldn't sort of expect to see, and that, that the data base wasn't sort of set up to determine or to reveal in any sense. But this is why why I think the, the sort of the mining analogy is so apt here. Is, is you've been sort of dig digging through this uh, this data dirt, as it were, and, and finding new new gold. You know, uh, the, these new uh, interesting correlations, uh, and that's, that's sort of extraordinary if you think about it, because yes, you, you can look through the records, or you can have the computer, I suppose, really look, look through the records of 36,000 patients, you say, and, uh, and look at a lot of different factors and, and discover this kind of thing. It would be, it would be uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do that without, without this kind of powerful uh, internet access that we now have, right? Yes, this would, uh, uh, if it weren't for the VA's uh, computing environment, this is not something that uh, could, have been, could have been done in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Not on that scale, at any rate. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, uh, that's wonderful. That's why, why I think. And I guess my, my sort of question here is, uh, and, and we'll get into this more in, in the next segment, where, sort of, where is this going? What, 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 what kind of uses are you, gonna, are you seeing for the future of this? If you're, I mean, uh, uh, right off the bat, uh, major drug replacement is one of the most common surgical procedures in this country. I think either fourth or fifth. Anyway, it's pretty high up there. Um, there's a lot of money uh, on, that is paid for these procedures in the part of, of, of insurers. Or, um, and the outcomes are, are impacted by uh, more may be impacted by uh, the, the consumption of opioids. Uh, this is this is double important, especially in this day and age of uh, of looking at surgical outcomes across the board. 
uh, in the advent of uh, uh, accountable care organizations, I mean, one of the uh, one of the Affordable Care Act uh, assertions that hospitals and indeed provider groups will be responsible for the outcomes of their procedures down the road. Um, it all ties down to uh, public health at the end of the day and how much uh, of the taxpayer's dollar is going to go that way. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, so, it's, so, so these things are all, are, all, are all important. It would seem to be that the risk uh, the, the risk for, for failed operations is pretty high and is actually comparable to the... There, there are other risk factors associated with, with failed uh, procedures, but we were able to show that opioids were comparable to those. Yeah. And that's, that's important. Yeah, no, it, it's critical stuff here, and, and it's, it's really, uh, really amazing that you found this. And we're going to dig deeper into this whole business af after we take a little bit of a break here. Uh, Alon ben Ari is uh, here on Likeable Science talking with me, Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science. And we're talking about data mining and sort of finding new gold in, in, in old data, as it were. We'll be right back. This is Alex Lee Hagan, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. We're back here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Joining me on Likeable Science today is Dr. Alan Ben-Ari. We're talking about data mining and this exciting new idea about taking huge existing sets of all kinds of data and using modern computational tools to extract very interesting information out of that data. Information that was not particularly even intended to sort of be in it originally. And uh, Alon was telling me at the, uh, in the earlier segment about using this to find how the responses to knee surgery of patients vary depending upon their history of opiate use, which is an intriguing area. But what had uh, really initially gotten me intrigued by his work was, was a, a, a paper he presented, uh, some work he presented at a conference last year. He has uh, investigated data on veterans who committed suicide and looked at their medical records and has found interesting sorts of correlations. And so, Alon, can you be, maybe tell us a little bit about, about that? Sure. This is a project which I teamed with a psychiatrist. And he had the ingenious idea of sifting through the full medical record of a quarter of a million veterans from the first Gulf War and trying to abstract psychiatric features from them. He was interested in evidence of uh, dysfunctional uh, families. He was interested in alcoholism. One of the things that sort of came under the, under the, under the uh, uh, examination was suicidal attempts. This is, this is a little different than suicidal, su suicidal behavior in the sense of attempting suicide and, and, and so forth being successful. Suicidal attempts may not result in death, but they, but they are important because, first of all, they are a marker of the severity of disease on the one hand, and they are a marker for repeated attempts down, down the road. Um, this is particularly important today uh, where uh, American servicemen coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan uh, are a risk group for high rates of suicidality. Absolutely. Right. Last, time, last time I checked, it would seem that the number of American casualties from fighting the Taliban and other uh, uh, terrorist groups in the Middle East 
comparable to those of American servicemen um, killing themselves back home. This is the uh, subject matter of a uh, Time magazine cover issue in, I think, July 2012. So we were looking, so, so we were, uh, the, 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 the methods that uh, we used were, we used, we used a little text mining and training algorithms to sift through, I think it was like 45 million documents. Clearly, this is not something that a human can do in a lifetime or a group of humans. And trying to abstract suicidal, suicidal attempts from the note. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of interest, both in the VA and the Department of Defense, to, 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 to capture these events. And in the past years, registries have been set up by these uh, uh, administrations to capture these, these uh, unfortunate attempts. However, they're, they're, they're pro there, there needs to be a human that will report them, so there's a finite chance of missing it or reporting it erroneously. However, a suicidal attempt, um, even if it's not coded as such, and there's a whole coding system for, for diseases, will generate a large footprint of, of, of notes in the patient's medical record. This, this is a major event. You'll have psychiatrists, social workers, and many other uh, providers involved in the, in the care of, 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 of this person. And we were, we were looking for that signal. That was, that was the idea. So the, you have to uh, teach the computer to, to be aware of and on the on lookout for a sort of sudden big pulses of inputs in the person's record. Right. I mean, this is this is down the road. If this system is validated and put into place, you can imagine that a, a process would run once a week or overnight over so many uh, uh, documents and would uh, would sift through suicidal attempts, for, for instance, or other critical events which, which are not captured as codes. And that, that's what we did. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the, friend, the, the psychiatrist friend I was working with, and which we still are, he was interested in replicating results from another study, but that, that was geared to, toward his, uh, his idea. But uh, it, this the suicidality bit of information sort of caught my eye, and I said, this is, this is interesting. Um, Along, along with that, we were abstracting many other features like uh, cardiac disease, hypertension, use of drugs, this kind of medication, and other, um, other behavioral patterns. And my idea was whether, whether we would be able to model this thing. We, we're, we're, we may not be able to understand mechanistically what underlies a suicidal attempt, but if we can put numbers on it, we can understand how this thing behaves. Right, and then oh, so. you, you can look at those same categories or factors in, in terms of your much larger population and per, perhaps predict future okay. attempts. Exactly. We were, we were interested, I was interested in prediction. Um, and ultimately, the data was very messy and very difficult. We had more than 100 different features we were looking at. And we needed some 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 strong some strong machinery to deal with it, and we we ended up using machine learning to uh, we apply machine learning to the problem, and we got two things out of it. One, we were able to tell which which features were the important ones that may may predict uh, suicidal attempts, and this is this is a large data set, ten years worth of data. Um, and then whether we were able to uh, predict at all. This is, again, this is not a prospective data set. Right. Uh, to be honest, we couldn't really make a true prediction, but we can say that if we divide the data set, for instance, for two halves, on, on the one we fit the model and the other one we predict, we're able to tell how accurate were our predictions were. And we were, we were doing pretty well. In this, in this regard, and we were able to discover some interesting features, behavioral features, that weren't known up to that point that may uh, predispose individuals to suicidal attempts.
Right, you, you discovered, I, I think, there are nine or ten key factors out of those hundred that you looked at that right. are, are really turn out to be very important. And when you lump all those ten together, you begin to have a, a pretty strong sense if, if, if all of them are showing certain trends that, that right. your, your patients are... So we, 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 Ken and I, we, we looked at 30 features which we thought were, were important, and we were able to narrow it down to about 12, which the algorithm thought were important. This is, this is, this is uh, so as, as, a, as a clinician, this is important because you think you understand your, your patient population, and here comes the algorithm, and uh, shows you otherwise. Right, right. It, it popped up features you might not have considered. Right. You know, we may have considered, or we thought we weren't that important. And right. then, then we would have thought, have a different idea, so to speak. Right, that, that's very intriguing. When, again, this is sort of the, this, using this data to, to look for sort of uh, information that it was not originally sort of set up to capture. And, and it tells you, like, there is a, a, right. a causative uh, milieu going on that, that we are not really understanding if, 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 you, if you're algorithm is finding these, this strong association. Strong association, causation, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a strong word to use. Right, no, no, no. That's, uh, association, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that, as I said, we don't really understand the mechanics of how this, how this, how this machine works, but if we can know how it behaves, that's, that's a step, that's a step, a step forward. Right, right. So, you, you spoke of uh, machine learning, and that's, of course, becoming a very hot topic these days. Uh, right. People are t talking now about having learning algorithms on sort of a whole new level where machines are able to learn in relatively sort of innovative ways that, that we've not had machine learning before. Are, are you incorporating some of these in your, in your system? Uh, not yet. I'm doing the more... Uh uh, how should I say, more established uh, machine learning stuff that has been around for the past uh, at least 10 years. Uh, the, the newer stuff coming out of, uh, I guess, Google and Facebook and others is, um, well, some of it is actually uh, becoming uh, publicly available. As, I, as it relates to what I said earlier, that we're seeing a great democratization of the tools uh, to, to look at to look at data, this is exactly what this is. If 10, 15 years ago, in order to run a machine learning algorithm, you either had to write the code yourself, which is not trivial, or pair up with someone in a computer science department, which is another difficulty, possibly. Today, um, with the advent of the open source uh, foundation or open source movement, if you want, these tools are made available. And with the increase of, of computing power, anyone with a decent laptop uh, and access to an internet connection can download these tools. The documentation is absolutely fantastic. Um, and there's a large community out there by ways of forums and, and, and others that will, uh, will help. If you have a question, you'll we'll, we'll get an answer, probably. I've used it several times and it works, works very well. So if you're interested in data and you want to apply these, these algorithms, they're out there for you. You need, you need to understand them and you need to understand what comes of it. But that's the, you need to understand the result. But the tools are there. Huh. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing too that, that we expect to be seeing more of this in the future. And we'll come back yes. and we'll talk about, about that when we, get, when we come back. Right now we're going to head off to a, another brief break here. Uh, I'm talking with Dr. Alain Ben-Ari from the uh, University of Washington and the Seattle VA Hospital. And we're talking about data mining. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. You're here on Lakeable Science. We'll be back shortly. Aloha, my name is Miley Scarpino, and I'm the host of the Empower Hour. If you're interested in health, nutrition, fitness, here on the island of Oahu, want to learn more about places to train at or different trainers available, then watch my show on Fridays at 3. We have a great time, and I hope that you'll come join us. Much aloha. Now go get swole. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. 
They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state, or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. And you're back here on Lake Amol Science, you know, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're talking about data mining today. Is this whole, well, it's not a new field, but, but uh, our guest today, Dr. Alan Ben-Ari from the Seattle VA Hospital and University of Washington, is certainly taking it to new, new heights or new depths, perhaps. Uh, it's mining, go deep, not, not high. Uh, we're, we're talking about how you extract interesting information that may not have originally been a, a purpose not have been purposely gathered out of large data sets. And we talked about uh, its use in terms of, of uh, predicting patient outcomes from knee surgery and, and finding uh, people who may be at risk for suicidal behavior, all these sorts of things. Uh, I know, uh, Alon, you also have done some work on, uh, or doing some work now on using retinal scans to look at uh, diabetic conditions. Right. Again, it uh, seems very unrelated in a sense, but... Uh, yeah, you're right. Well, yes, but there, there, there's big medicine out there. It's true, and I'm, 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 I'm a specialist in anesthesiology, that's true. But uh, there, there's also medicine, big medicine, that um, out there. And, and it's, it's interesting. The, the, the retina is an interesting place where, where one has ac direct access under, under you know, light vision to blood vessels and to the observation of how those diseases, systemic diseases, manifest themselves in the eye. Now, the eye might be a, uh, an end organ to the, of the disease, and it may serve as a marker for the disease severity. Uh, people in the past uh, five years, people have looked uh, to whether there, since, since diabetes is a, is, a, is, a, is a common condition in the population, um, the, audience is, the, the audience at home needs to know that diabetes is the leading cause of, of blindness in the West among working age individuals, uh, people uh, 40, 65 ish. Um, so this is, this is, this is significant. Um, Diabetes is, 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 is yet another systemic disease, and, and manifestations are involving mostly the microvasculature, the small, the small blood vessels, be it in the, in the heart, in the kidneys, where patients with, with diabetes will go on, um, unfortunately, to develop kidney failure and requiring dialysis, and. There's also, the, the diabetes will also involve the retina of the eye causing blindness. Now, the, 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 the way the disease progresses has visual manifestations which an ophthalmologist can actually look at with a fundoscopy. It's a simple device and, and we can, uh, and there, there are ways to capture those images. So I was interested, and many others before me were interested, in are we able to look at the eye, look at the eye and tell the, not only the, the disease severity, but whether we were able to tell if this patient is at risk for kidney failure or for vascular disease necessitating amputation and so on down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work has been done on that. My angle is, is double. Uh, I'm looking for computational features. Uh, the ophthalmologists are very good at making diagnosis by looking at the retina. Uh, and, they, and they have uh, various uh, terms for severity and, and to describe what they see. Um, my interest lies in whether we can come up with a computational model using image processing. This is all algorithmic, uh, you know, there's, no, there's no ophthalmology there, so to speak. Right. But whether whether those clinical terms which the ophthalmologists are using translate to numbers. Right. Can, can, you, can you put their, the words they're using to describe this into some, almost a mathematical formula, right? Right. If you can, 
if you if you can say that this diabetic retinopathy or proliferative retinopathy has a certain matrix associated with it. Right. Certain spacing of blood vessels or damage to right. cells or right. Right. And now that's that's my interesting whether this this is more sensitive or less sensitive as a predictive tool for let's say uh, end stage renal disease necessitating uh, dialysis. Right. So right. the idea would be that you have a computer scan thousands and thousands of these retinal images, right. and hopefully it is learning to look for certain learning to see and recognize certain patterns there that are then associated with either the severity of the disease or the next stage of the disease or whatever, right? Correct. Yeah. And if we, can, if we can sift through a large population, and diabetic, diabetic patients are being followed, or they should be followed routinely uh, by ophthalmologists at least once a year for their, uh, for their uh, retinal manifestations of their disease. And if we could uh, sift out the high-risk patients, maybe something can be done. Maybe a retarding cancer adrenal disease. Just to give you an idea, this is this is somewhat old data, at least a few years old, but the, the new incidence of the cancer adrenal disease in America is about half a million new patients a year. Wow. wow. That's, a, uh, that's a big number and a qu quite a load. Yeah, and uh, I know uh, diabetes is a huge issue out here in the Pacific. Uh, in, uh, Pacific Islands have horrendous uh, rates of diabetes and, and very limited treatment options for it. So again, this, having a, a simpler predictive tool would be an extremely powerful uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, technique. But this, yeah. this, this, it seems to me, gets into a really rich uh, idea. When you, if you've got your machine learning to take data, you, I mean, this ties into all kinds of other interesting uh, processes even beyond medicine. Uh, a few weeks ago, Jay Fidel and I were, were talking about uh, self-driving cars, and it's, you know, in, to some extent, a, a parallel process. The cars have to be learning about patterns, in their, in their case, patterns of motion around them that are significant versus insignificant, and recognizing these and taking appropriate action, uh, a little more in perhaps real time than, than what you're asking of this, but... Uh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, we're not looking at uh, estimates. We need a real answer here. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and in real time, this is more of the cutting edge stuff done by by people at the uh, at the larger companies, mainly Google. Right. Uh, uh, I guess some work is also done in the Department of Defense and on similar lines. Um, it is it is it is where things are going. I was that I think I read a, f a few weeks ago where where a computer was uh, basically trained himself to play a, a video game. Uh, within hours, he could. Uh, but, I mean, he 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 moved the, the scoreboard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's there's something to be to be said about that, and maybe to put this some thinking whether whether this is a good or not. This this is uh, whether, whether this machine. We're we're looking at the the dawn of the robots here. Uh, I don't know. This is this is something to be discussed. My my interest. Uh, lies in abstracting computational features that we can predict uh, and make, uh, make a difference for, for patients. And another, s another thing that might be spawned out of this thing is a, knowledge, a system of knowledge representation of data because the, the, the amount of data that is, that is out there that we're accumulating, that I'm manipulating is huge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the question is whether we can train an algorithm that would sift through it and have a machine go through the data. Um, I, haven't invent, I haven't invented uh, any of this. People have been thinking of, along these lines many more years than I've been dealing with this thing. Um, and, but I'm, I'm also interested in developing what is known as a ontology for these images. So other people can come and, 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 and use them to uh, to uh, for their own uh, own interests. Um, this is down the road. So you're you're actually trying to create more data banks. That other people will be able to later to mine for yet further things, huh? Right. Because we're uh, 
uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in these in these questions. Maybe we can, you know, um, there, there, there are huge bodies of co collaborative bodies usually out there, the model to go, I think of the Open Biomedical Ontology Foundry is, is, is one big name. Uh, if people will Google the Herbal Foundry, there's no one, they'll, they'll discover a uh, knowledge representation from many, many fields in, in biomedicine. Um, especially geared for machines to sift through data and make inferences. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it sounds all almost, uh, I mean, truly futuristic, and yet it, it's here today. Obviously, you're, you're doing this, but it, it, it clearly is a growing, uh, growing field. What, what, what is your uh, prediction about, about what's sort of going to be the next big thing that people will be uh, finding out from this, or, or where, what, what disease classes do you think are going to be tackled next with it? Oh, I don't know, you know, you know what they say, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Um, I think um, if the past 20, 30 years were any uh, um, teacher saying thing is that we stand to be surprised. Uh, the advent, we're, we're going to see a uh, consolidation of data sets. You're looking at radiologists, okay, another, another with a key, key group of physicians uh, who are trying to correlate image features, which we mentioned earlier, with genomics. There's a, an explosion of genetic data mm -hmm. in, in various ways, be it uh, DNA, RNA, proteins, you name it, and trying to come coming from directly from patients and trying to link it to uh, radiological images, say, of lung tumors, which is a, which is a big, big challenge yet. Mm -hmm. uh, colon cancer, another big, uh, high, high up there in terms of incidence, and so on. So we're, we're, we're looking at some very interesting times to anyone interested in data and trying to find interesting associations, hopefully something meaningful will come out of it by ways of a new drug, something that would uh, allow intervention. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like we're on the, on the verge of very, as you say, very exciting times with, with lots, of, lots of potentially interesting things to, to, uh, to be, be dug up here, as it were, out of, out of this data. And, uh, mm -hmm. It, it's intriguing to hear of your work about uh, in this field. I, I enjoy this. I've certainly learned a, a, an amazing amount here, and, and I know our our viewers have too here. We're going to wrap it up for today on Likeable Science, and I'd like, like to thank you, Alon, for uh, having been here with us, taking time and uh, to share your expertise. It's, Thanks for been, it's been wonderful, wonderful having you. This is uh, Ethan Allen, and signing off for another episode of Likeable Science. Hope to see you next week.